Welcome back to the show. Check out these headlines here. We got the highlights from DC FinTech Week. It's Michael S. Barr, the Office of Comptroller of Currency as well, and so much more. Watch out, crypto. Here comes the Federal Reserve. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter and YouTube for exclusive content. Right now, it's $1.39 trillion market cap for crypto. The market is up 1.7%. Bitcoin, 35300 plus. Ethereum, 1882 cents. And we see the Tether market cap is $85 billion, $85.9 billion right there. Holy moly, that's a lot. Uh, we'll be talking about that in a second. Uh, 69 cents for XRP. We're up a half a percent on the 24 hour. We're up 13.7% on the seven day, which is running and outperforming the market and certainly Bitcoin dominance. Wouldn't call it a decoupling at this point, but it's certainly worth noting now, isn't it? Let's look at the range of price here between 66 cents overnight and 69 cents plus. This is where we are right now, ladies and gentlemen. That's our trading range. So things are moving pretty wildly. That's a pretty wide spread right there. Not what we normally see. So keep an eye on it. Everybody in the technical analyst world is very excited about where we are right now. So we'll keep an eye on that as well. But let's start right here with DC FinTech Week. And this is Michael uh, Hugh uh, from the uh, he's the acting comptroller of currency. Brian Brooks's former role. And basically, take a listen to what's going on here as he separates the idea between real world assets and speculative crypto trading. Take a listen. Uh, particularly when it comes to crypto, which, yep. of course, has had its own issues uh, over the last year. Uh, we still have not gotten the formal regulation. I know that's not necessarily on your shoulders, so you should maybe go talk to Gary and a couple other people to see where <laughs> they stand. But is there a solution, I guess, to the problem that I feel like crypto itself kind of created? Yeah. So. Um, in my travels over the past year or so, mm -hmm. and I, I talk to financial institutions, technology firms, other regulators globally, whenever this comes up, something I have really, um, it's really emerged, there seems to be more and more of a divide between crypto on the one hand and tokenization of real world assets and liabilities on the other hand. Mm -hmm. There it is. So he's giving you the difference between a speculative asset and tokenizing real world assets. And we all know that XRP and XLM help with the latter, the tokenizing of real world assets and the settlement thereof. Now, this here is Michael S. Barr. And if you don't know, that's Dr. Chris Brummer right there, who is absolutely brilliant and uh, was also in the movie Cryptonaires. Don't let anybody tell you it wasn't real. Dr. Brummer was featured in that movie and he was amazing uh you can watch it on youtube but nevertheless i want you to hear michael s Barr, former U uh, u.s treasury official also one of the architects of the dodd frank act that birthed the financial stability oversight council also a former ripple advisor now the vp of the federal reserve take a listen uh, we think about the role of AI in making sure that we have a fair financial system. So if we have uh, AI that reproduces or worsens um, social disparities based on race or ethnicity or gender in our society, if it's trained on bad data or if it has algorithms that replicate that kind of bias in our society, that's, that's very bad. Yeah. And he goes on to say here, and I brought this up and wanted to start here with him because artificial intelligence, I believe, is going to help push crypto faster through regulation and legislation. And the reason I believe that is because it's a bigger, scarier threat. But you can't go and regulate and legislate artificial intelligence and just say, well, we'll get to crypto later. 
right? These really are two separate things, but they have to be dealt with in the same respect when it comes to legislation. And in that regard, you know, uh, artificial intelligence has to be a long-term view of how it can affect is what he goes on to say here. But I wanted to make the point about the fact that artificial intelligence, I believe, is going to heighten the need for legislation of crypto and certainly stable coins, which I think will come before crypto. Nevertheless, let's take a listen to this as the conversation continues, and we will have to take a few breaks in this because there's so much good information inside of this clip. We've got to make sure we highlight where the special spots are. Take a listen. Takeaways. Uh, it's one of those issues that I, I've always found, even in, in the media, like it's 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 worth a little bit of of, of, of attention. I think it's super super important. Other uh, issues that have. Uh, attracted plenty of attention is uh, involves uh, CBDCs and stable coins and 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 really where the Fed is at this point in time at kind of thinking through uh, the place for, for for I should say CBDCs stable coins and tokenized deposits each uh, 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 different in, in, in their own ways but maybe I'll just start off with the CBDC stable coin question and then maybe uh, uh, an extra question or two on 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 the tokenized deposits where, where are you in, in your thinking right now well, let me um, let me take on uh, the question of stable coins first. Sure. So there's obviously a lot of innovation happening in the private sector uh, around stable coins. There we and go. we want to make sure we can harness that innovation to improve efficiencies if we can in the payment system. I do think that if uh, a private sector entity is creating a stable coin that is connected to a fiat currency, uh, in, in the case that we care about the United States dollar, they're creating a form of private money. And private money um, needs to be well regulated. Private money, we've seen many examples throughout history, can cause significant risks in the financial system. Now, very quickly here, does that sound like USD Tether being a problem or a solution? Harness. We could harness the technology, right? I mean, uh, there's nothing about USD Tether that says it's harnessed unless it's been captured by the Department of Justice. And private money that's linked to the dollar basically borrows the trust of the Federal Reserve oh, yeah. in its issuance. So we think there's a very strong issue, uh, interest uh, in having strong federal regulation of stable coins um, that makes sure that the Federal Reserve can approve stablecoin issuers, can regulate stablecoin issuers, can enforce against stablecoin issuers, and the set of uh, protections around that, including how you deal with wallets and making sure that they're safe and sound. All of that, I think we need a strong federal framework for, and uh, we don't have one of those yet. So, 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 so you really do need the, Fed, the, 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 the Congress is, to, to establish that in, in an absence, that there's uh, limited uh, um, a limited amount of things that the Fed can 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 do, or is it just a kind of a stopgap? We okay. think, you know, I, I would just say, as a policy matter, it's better if the Congress can decide the basic rules of the road. Yeah. Um, now, on, on central bank digital currency, uh, there are also a lot of innovation happening around in the world uh, in that, and there are some countries who have moved forward with stable coins, at least in a uh, limited way. There are other co many countries who are involved in research and development. Uh, many countries thinking about the policy framework. Um, at, at the Federal Reserve, we're also doing, uh, taking a look at central bank digital currency. Uh, we're very focused on research questions. Uh, we are not, um, uh, we haven't made a decision about whether it would be a good idea or not a good idea. Well, let, let's not kid ourselves here. He's been very clear in the last minute and a half telling you that they are not cool with a private sector entity offering the only product the Federal Reserve has ever had, which is U.S. dollars. <laughs> so let's be clear here. This sounds very subtle and far off, but he made it very clear that any private sector issuing the products from the Federal Reserve that are backed by that dollar need to be under prudential regulation. Keep listening to establish this or that approach to central bank digital currency. Mm -hmm. uh, if we did decide it made sense to do, for example, a retail central bank digital currency, we would only do that if Congress and the executive branch mm -hmm. clearly authorized us to do that 
uh, step with, with respect to retail CBDC. And very quickly, the House of Representatives passed a bill that says uh, they don't want the Fed to have that power. That's got to pass the Senate, which it probably will not at this point, but keep listening. And in the meanwhile, we're doing research, and the research will help inform decision making about what we might recommend and also help think about what the right payments architecture and infrastructure we might need, whether we use a CBDC or don't use a CBDC. Research can help inform how we can improve the payments infrastructure overall. I, I think one of the, the, the questions that some of the people um, either attending or watching may, may have is uh, when you think about the, the Fed's infrastructure, and it was interesting you were talking about like the barring off the reputation of the, of, of the Fed. That's, that's, that's an interesting way of, of, of certainly um, thinking about it. There are also very direct ways in which people would like to build on top of Fed uh, infrastructure. You uh -huh. see other countries uh, who, you know, who have moved in, in that direction. W what kinds of principles guide your thinking in terms of how and under what circumstances to enable that, particularly you know, sort of outside of the traditional banking system? So now we're talking about payment infrastructure. Uh, who has that uh, Ripple CBDC platform? Yeah, they have it. Yeah. Well, let me just start by you know how I think about payments infrastructure in general and what principles are really important in it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for me at least, I think we want a payments infrastructure that promotes financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. We want a payments infrastructure that works for everybody. That works for low-income people as well as upper-income people that serve small businesses and not just big businesses. So we want to make sure our infrastructure you know, is accessible to the real economy in that way. And we want to have an infrastructure that also works for the diversity of sizes and types of financial institutions in our country, from small community banks um, all the way up to the largest banks. So financial inclusion, diversity of approach, I think, is really critical. Of course, we need a, a financial architecture, a payments architecture, that is safe and secure. <laughs> so we need a payment infrastructure that is safe. Now, I wonder if Michael S. Barr, now that he is the vice chairman, vice president of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, may call on his time as a Ripple advisor and say, you know, I do happen to know of a payment infrastructure company, a blockchain infrastructure company named Ripple that could serve in a great way for the United States in this regard. <laughs> and this is Fedwire and ISO 20022 conversation and Laura Sullivan here from Forum 3 going to tell you very quickly that they're moving all of it over. We're talking about trillions of dollars, ladies and gentlemen. Take a quick listen here. 2022 do here? Well, the, probably the single biggest thing um, that ISO will do for Fedwire is align it with many of the other payment systems around the world. There, we go. Um, there is a fairly significant portion of the Fedwire volume that actually ends up either originates or ends up overseas. Um, most of those payments are um, flow through what's a network called SWIFT. And SWIFT has moved to ISO. So, you know, the, the, those systems have never been aligned before in terms of using the same format. And I'm not going to say they're 100% match because we've had to have that disappointing discussion with a lot of our customers that ISO is not necessarily one flavor that different systems have implemented it slightly differently, but it is still vastly the same. So being able to transport data without fear of dropping data or having to wedge it into fields that aren't really fit for purpose um, is one of the biggest things with uh, Fedwire. There are also some improvements in terms of messaging, much more standardized, um, a lot more response. So with Fedwire, certainly when you send a Fedwire to the Listen, Fed, you got a response saying, yeah, I got it. But if you sent um, a request uh, for payment, which is called a drawdown in Fedware terminology, or if you sent um, a request to, to have money returned to you, you didn't necessarily get a response unless it was a positive or a negative. Now there are specific message types that can be used to respond, even if it's just to say, yeah, I got it, I'm looking at it. But that's, but that's a huge difference for banks. At least you know somebody's paying attention to you and you don't have to continually send follow-up messages to ask what's going on with it. 
Think of that for a moment. This is the payment system for Fedwire. She's talking about how antiquated it is that you send them a, hey, what's going on with the pay? And like nobody literally would even respond, right? And now she feels like, oh, we've made just these giant strides. At least now if I have a question about the payment, I know that someone's looking at it. <laughs> I don't even have a definitive answer. I just know it's, it, yeah, I saw that. Get it after a smoke break. You know what I mean? Meanwhile, around the rest of the world, let's take a look at what's going on here because I tell you, the world is not waiting for the United States to get its act together here. This is why I'm highlighting here, Dubai Financial Services Authority, as we reported last week, has announced a notable advancement in enterprise blockchain and cryptocurrency sector and has sanctioned the use of XRP within Dubai International Financial Center. This is is amazing. XRP is the first virtual asset to gain such approval here. You know, watch out, ladies and gentlemen. This can be a massive, massive thing. We know that Dubai is going to be a huge financial hub and crypto hub, as well as the UK and Japan and Singapore. They don't need the United States' approval for nothing. So keep an eye on it. Things are getting interesting, ladies and gentlemen. And again, the United States, largest economy in the world. I think when they move, they'll move in the 11th hour. They'll move so swift and so quickly that it'll happen. And when it does, it's over. That's where the whole world is now. And that's why I believe the United States will move last when it does move at all. So here we see XRP blast off T minus seven days says Crypto Insight UK. And we got to give him props. Ever since he started his countdown, the price has started moving in the right way. And he's documenting retracements here. But you know what? We're watching all of this. We could go potentially to 62 cents. But you know what? If we don't, we're going sky's the limit here, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, things are still looking the way the te technical analysts like to see it. And then we're going to take a look at this as well from Crypto Toes, who says, on the closer look, XRP Daily just closed above support. So far, so good. And we'll keep an update coming. So that's where we are. We're not upset about it. We're happy about it. And in fact, I'm asking you to come on in because the conversation is getting ready to start. It's the Freedom Zone, ladies and gentlemen. Join the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of others that are in this group having incredible conversations because this is censorship protection ladies and gentlemen this is really honoring our ability to have freedom of speech inside of this group about topics that we don't even dare touch on this channel uh and today we're going back to that private island that nobody's allowed to talk about and we're going to ask why is jp morgan paying 75 million dollars connected to the guy who had the private island yeah, we got that and so much more in there. We'll see you on the inside of the Freedom Zone. Not financial advice from me or anyone else. I'll catch all of you on the next one.